Excellent. Thank you so much, ladies. And thanks to everybody that's joining us today. We're really excited. We have the whole in-hand team here today, except for our lovely office lady, Susan. Behind the camera is Peter Watkins. So thank you very much, Pete, for um, being our cameraman today. Uh, we have Kim Krebs here with us, as well as uh, Cassidy um, Bernard. So we're really excited um, that everybody is here today and uh, we're going to present to you the horse's hind limb. Um, before we get started, we will let you know that we really like interactive um, sessions. So as the gals were mentioning at the beginning, we want to make sure that um, if you have a question as we go, you make sure, um, like they were mentioning, that you raise your hand and ask it um, so that we can make sure that everybody is understanding what we're speaking about. We really want you guys to go home with a... Um, uh, knowledge of what's happening with your horse's hind limb and your horse's pelvis, but also some things that you guys can do with your own horses that are safe for any healthy horse. So make sure you stay to the end of the presentation because we are going to speak about some anatomy and, and some uh, symmetry issues that you guys are going to come across with your own horses. But we're also going to make sure that you guys have three activations and three stretches that you're going to be able to utilize on your horse. So we're going to start tonight's presentation with Kim Krebs um, speaking a little bit about what you're going to look for with your horse's hind limb. All right, thanks Tina for that introduction and thanks again everybody for joining us. Today um, the hind end is an area of the horse that us as body workers spend quite a bit of our time thinking about because, and I think this is the best way I've ever heard it put, the horse really is a rear engine driver. Um, the whole aspect of the horse has the power coming from some large muscles, largest muscles that you're going to find in the rest of their body. And then just the way that the anatomy is built, Tina's going to touch on this further, but that power that they get through that hind end is what causes the locomotion forward. So this area oftentimes may not be what we call overtly lame. And if you do have an overtly lame horse, so that is one that is very obviously having difficulties um, with a limb and is very much favoring one side, then please, 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 the very first step, you have got to phone your veterinarian and have them diagnose it. Because what we're talking about today are not things that are within the veterinary realm. These are things within our own realm. So as an owner, if you're noticing that overt lameness, you need to get your vet to um, be involved with it first. Having said that, um, some of the things that you are going to notice are gonna be really subtle. The subtleties are the things that with the hind end, they're going to start to build on and build on and build on before you actually get those overt lamenesses unless of obviously of a catastrophic accident or something like that. But so these are the things that you as an owner can be very acutely aware of that if you start feeling them, you know that very soon you're going um, to maybe have some issues and you wanna stay on top of those, okay? So a couple of things um, that we really wanna uh, note is the impulsion. So that impulsion is the surge that is having um, that are, or is that is occurring through that hind limb and coming forward into the body. So you may notice little things like all of a sudden they're not pushing off as much as they normally have in the past. Um, you may notice that they're not wanting to hold their stop. So if you're involved in disciplines such as cutting or reining or uh, barrel racing, anything where they have to really get into the ground and hold that stop, and all of a sudden they're starting to pop out of it. That's another good indication that, you know, something isn't, uh, or that something is a mess. Transitions. If you are normally having no problems with transitions and all of a sudden, they're taking a stride or two before they actually get the transition. Those are another area that you can start to think about, okay, what's actually going on? Obviously, we also want to make sure that anything else in the environment isn't causing them to be distracted, but you know your horse the best as anyone. So these are little subtleties. It will often be described as a horse just simply having a flat tire, like they just cannot get underneath themselves and push off. 
Um, so that's another really good explanation people have, have said. Um, again, it's not overt lameness. These are just these little, little things. The power that we're gonna talk about from the hind end is coming from these large muscles um, that we have the gluteals, the hamstrings specifically, but you have the quads as well, but these are all the really powerful muscles that are gonna get build that strength um, and cause that help with that impulsion to move forward. So you will potentially notice again, a step down in their training. So if you are, are performing or the horse is performing at a certain level and all of a sudden, they're not able to main that, maintain that level. They're still able to do their job, but just not at the same uh, degree of difficulty as they had, you know, the weeks prior to. Um, in the timed events, you may notice that all of a sudden it's the hundredth of a second that is starting to get shaved off of your time. So those are things again you wanted to be, you want to be really really aware of. But just in general, you're going to notice potentially a just decline in their abilities that isn't their norm. Some of the other things that are maybe going to be more apparent are attitude. So with their attitude, you might notice their ears being pinned back. You might notice that when you go to catch them even, they run away from you uh, because they know a ride's coming, which is not what they usually do. Uh, you may start to see them bucking or crow hopping. Those little things, again, or not necessarily little in the case of bucking or crow hopping, but um, they can mean soreness anywhere. But because we know that the powerhouse is this hind end and that that movement forward, oftentimes this is where we will see a lot of those issues. When you're grooming your horse, the other thing that you want to be aware of is as you're laying hands on the horse and you're coming around the hind end, you're picking the limb up to pick out the feet and you notice potentially that they're restricted. They're not wanting to pick that foot up or they're not wanting to hold that foot. You maybe notice a little bit of swelling here or there or a change in temperature. So what's normally hot is really, um, or sorry, what's normally cold or cool touch is all of a sudden really hot or vice versa. You might on the lower limbs all of a sudden um, have it really, really cold. So you wanna be able to notice those little things and those are gonna be good indicators that you have something going on in the high bed. Yeah, totally, Kim. That was a really great description. I think, you know, um, when we're looking at our horse's hind limb, because 60% of the weight bearing is um, naturally on the forehand, um, and we are always trying to get our horse to use the hind end better, um, we sometimes focus a little bit more on what we're seeing in front. And because of that, um, we miss some of the things that are happening behind. So we're not going to go too deep into anatomy, but I do think it's pretty important to be able to roll through some of the anatomy here. So uh, Cassidy, if you could bring the pelvis over for us, let's just talk through a little bit of this so you guys know where things are. Because sometimes we, we see things on the, on the horse itself, but we're not quite sure exactly what we're noting. I'll just step in front here so you can really see the um, horse be behind the bony structure there. So of course, here on the outside, this is what you guys are gonna call your point of the hip, okay? And Cassidy's gonna talk in a little bit here about some symmetry when we're looking at bones. Um, but if you look here at this structure, if we turn it here so the camera's looking straight in, can you see the really large structure that we're actually looking at here? Okay, this wing of the um, uh, wing of the ilium coming all the way up and uh, making this sacral tuberosity that's right at the very tippy top of our horse here. And we're going to talk about the SI joint here in a minute. But people don't realize how large the pelvis is. So this horse here is standing about 16.2. This um, skeleton that we have here was a 15-3, uh, just about 16 hand guy. So this pelvis, just a little bit smaller, but you can see, you know, the bulk of this bony structure. Then here at the very back, this is going to be your seat bones or your ischiatic tuberosity. Um, and so that you can see there how the whole structure of the pelvis comes together. Now, Kim was talking about that the hind limb is your power and your ability to actually get the thrust into your horse. Well, that thrust, of course, is created by the lower legs and we'll talk through those bones in a second. But what we wanna talk about is how that thrust actually gets from the legs and propels the horse 
horse forward. And that's through our horse's SI joint. I'll just grab our horse's sacrum. So this is our horse's sacrum. And if we put it in um, the horse here, we would be able to see the lumbar vertebrae of the horse coming here. Then the top of the croup that you guys are seeing, that is going to be the sacral tuberosities that we had already pointed out. And I'm going to put this structure, the sacrum, into the um, pelvis so that you can see how these two go together. But this sacrum actually sitting within the body. And then back here, you guys are actually feeling the very tops of the dorsal processes of this sacrum itself, okay? So if we go ahead and I'll steal this from Cassidy, thank you so much, and I'll put this in here. Okay, so if we put this together, we're gonna see here that there is a articular um, structure here where the sacrum is going to be able to attach to. And on this sacrum itself, as Pete's zooming in there, can you see the um, articular processes here on the edge of the actual sacrum itself? So that is actually what is attaching to your horse's pelvis. And if I put these together, try to hold everything together here, okay? As we put these together, you can see the, I have it tilted too far forward, there we go. You can see the actual joint surface there of what we are going to call our sacral iliac joint or our SI joint. Now, lots of people think that that SI joint is way up here. When we look at the horse, we, we point to this area and we say, this is my horse's SI joint. But actually that joint surface you guys can see because of course this is the top that we're um, palpating with muscle structure over the top and ligamental structure. But our joint surface is way down inside here, okay? This joint surface is made to be very stable, okay? Um, if you read some of Deb Bennett's research, she says that this joint surface can move on 42 different planes. But when it moves, gang, it needs to move in a stable type structure. This joint surface is not moving like another joint where you would visualize it actually having um, an actual plane or a range of motion would be a better way to say it. This is actually going to move very subtly with teeny tiny movements, okay, to be able to make those 42 different planes of movement that this can work on. Now, its job, as I said earlier, is to be able to take the propulsion created by the hind limb and put it into the axial skeleton and propel your horse forward by moving the energy through your horse's spine. This joint is really important to recognize how it's doing on your horse and to be able to keep very sound. Because if this joint has soreness in it, then as Kim had mentioned, your horse is going to have that little bit of a flat tire. Now, because it doesn't have a large articular surface that it moves on, meaning that it doesn't have a big range of motion like the femur, which we're gonna show you in a second. So the leg is moving, but this joint itself is not, is, is staying very stable. And because it doesn't have a large plane of movement, you don't have that overt lameness. So it's so easy for people to not recognize that their horse has SI soreness for quite a while. Um, because again, we are looking for our horse limping, our horse not being able to turn, those kind of things. And because of the stability in this joint surface, you are actually, um, it, your horse is actually able to function, but just not as a, at such a high level. So very interesting joint to be able to talk through. I'm going to put this sacrum down or I'll give it to Cassidy and I'll keep this guy and we'll have a look at the femur. And Cassidy, if we could get that um, right femur, it'd be perfect for the side that we're on. Perfect. Yay, you rock, sister. Okay, so here's a horse's femur. So, you know, if, you, if you're going to have a look here, I'm 5'5", I'm five five. If you're going to have a look at the size and the thickness of a horse's femur, this, of course, same as a human, your largest bone in the body, but this bone is going to take all of that strength that we're going to create, and we're going to actually be able to make movement with it. Now, there's the ball of our femur, okay, and here's our socket joint. So, same as us, ball and socket joint, and you're going to notice there's, there's a little notch in there, if we can kind of get a good view of that little notch. Okay, and that little notch is going to have a very strong ligament 
that's going to go into and attach to this little notch inside of our ball joint. And that is going to keep this ball and socket together. Okay. So there's our ball and socket joint. And this has full articulation in every direction we would like. So this is where our horse's uh, laterals are coming from, where your major push is coming from, where all of your major range of motion is coming from in your horse's hind limb. So really important to realize how uh, big uh, this uh, bone is, how important it is. And interestingly enough, horses don't get a ton of actual hip arthritis. Um, and so this joint itself usually stays um, pretty sound for horses. Okay, so I'll trade you, Cassidy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, gang, let's go ahead and put this femur on. Our friend Coco, I should mention that we are so lucky. It was absolutely terrible day here in Southern Alberta, freezing and sleet. Um, depend, I'm not sure where everybody's from and what day you guys had, but we're so thankful to Evan Tire Farms for letting us come over tonight um, so that we didn't have to be outside. So here we are over at Evan Tire Farms. Thank you so much to Rachel and Jim and the whole team at Evan Tire Farms. This is one of Rachel's Grand Prix horses. This is Coco. Um, so she's our demo horse for today. Um, so if I'm going to go ahead and put the femur on Coco, um, now this is going to be hard for you guys to palpate, but just so you can see what's happening, I'm going to look for this firm surface. I'm looking for the uh, greater trochanter here of the femur. And when I find this firm surface, I know that that is where uh, Coco's ball and socket is going to be. Okay, and I'm gonna go ahead and lay this in. Oh, we got the wrong femur, little sweet pea. That's okay. All right, thank you. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and put this in here and um, we're gonna see where this femur is gonna lay in uh, her body. And we can see these nice or, or round uh, trochlear ridges at the bottom, these nice round ridges that are here at the bottom, okay? On these round ridges at the bottom, I bet then I've got the, I'll take the opposite tib tibia too, please. Perfecto mundo. Thanks, little sweet pea. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that in one second. So we see these nice round trochlear ridges, and those are going to come in, and we're going to be able to palpate those on your horse just underneath where your dimple of the stifle is. So we've got that nice little dimple that's there, and we're going to be able to reach down, and we're going to be able to find those nice round trochlear ridges there and that's and to be able to find that that's important to us because we're going to know that our patella is going to be just on the top of there then we're going to take our horse's tibia and we're going to be able to put that on here and so if we see the structure sitting on coco here just like it would sit in real life that is going to be your stifle joint and maybe cassidy with one more hand would you put that patella on the top there Yep, perfect. So then we can see that nice, that where the patella is going to sit and how our stifle joint is made up there. Okay, excellent. That's perfect. Now, interestingly enough, we always think when we palpate our own knee, because the horse's stifle is just like our knee, when we palpate our own knee, we think that that patella is sitting right in between these two um, bones. You know, we think that it wants to sit in there, but you did note where Cassidy did put it on. It's sitting way up here at the top. And that's so that we can have, sorry, I turned my bone on you guys. And that's so we can have full articulation through this stifle joint. Now this stifle joint can be a rascal, you guys, because it often, um, because it doesn't have a lot of support around it, it often can get some injuries. And we're gonna show you some really important exercises for the stifle as we go. We're also gonna show you guys how to look at your own horse's stifle and how it moves to see if there's something that's not quite right with that stifle. So that's gonna be an important part of the presentation coming up as well. Okay, I'll trade you that guy. Um, and uh, I'll just take the uh, right hawk if I could. I think I got the right one. Perfect, you rock. All right, let's see. The test. The test, exactly. The test. Okay, so this is, this is left hawk. Of course it is. <laughs> 
That's okay. It's no biggie. We thought we were so smart and had our, our table set up and we set it up backwards. It's like a puzzle. There we go. Okay. So this is the other part that we want to show you guys today. And this is really important. So here's your horse's hawk. And everybody has seen that um, calcaneal tuberosity, that point of the hawk pointing out, okay? But I think the thing that'll be really interesting for people is if I turn this hawk towards you guys, can you see if Pete has it lined up so it's straight with the bone? Can you guys see that the round ridges here or the trochlear ridges of the talus, do you see that they slightly point to the outside? Okay, and so when this tibia is going to go ahead and slide on our trochlear ridges, those, that um, hawk is going to point slightly to the outside. And this is always a very interesting thing to people because they think to themselves, so I'm going to stand a little bit duck footed right now. They think to themselves that it, they would want their horse conformed perfectly straight. But if their horse is perfectly straight, it would mean that these trochlear ridges, these round ridges that the, that the tibia is going to be able to articulate on or move on um, are actually going to be pointed straight forward rather than on an angle. And that actually puts more torque on the um, joint itself. And it also doesn't allow the hind limb to be able to pass, uh, go past the barrel. So you would see a horse that would be um, in full gallop and their hawks would be coming up and hitting themselves in the barrel. So this is a very interesting thing. You know, when people look at the hind limb of a horse, which Cassidy is going to talk us through in a second, they're going to think to themselves that, you know, we don't want to see a horse that's slightly towed out. And you can see here if uh, Pete pans onto our friend Coco, and she's not standing perfectly square right now, but she's very well conformed in the hind limb. She's just slightly pointed out with that, um, with that toe. And so that's because of how the bony structure works in the hawk itself. The other thing that we want to talk about before we leave the hawk is we want to talk about how this is locked in to the articular process at the bottom of our um, tibia. So these, this has no lateral movement in it. So if there was a cartilage in here, there would be no room for play in this joint. The hawk only has flexion and extension. And this is really important for, you, for us to think about as horse owners, because when you guys watch the horse move, and we've got a video coming up that's a little slowed down so that you can get a good uh, view of it. And we're gonna watch a couple horses here at the barn move. If you see a horse move with that hawk wobble, or it has a little bit of um, external rotation in that hawk when the, um, um, uh, the leg has hit the ground, we know that that's being created by soft tissue for, further up the leg. And we know that there is definitely then going to be some imbalances within the leg that we really want to work on. Because what's the one joint when you're looking at um, a performance horse that often has to get injected? Hawks, right? It's the one that often breaks down. And we really need to think about that, that this joint doesn't have an um, option to have any kind of lateral mobility to it. It has to take all the load that it's create that has been created with the footfall onto the ground. Okay. So I'll give you these back. I think we're good without this. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, one more thing in the anatomy world before we're going to move on um, and Cassidy's going to talk us through a little bit of symmetry that you guys are going to look at. The one thing that we have to really think about with hind limbs is what's called the stay apparatus. The stay apparatus is going to be able to help them to sleep. And that's an important thing, of course, for horses to be able to sleep standing up. And to do that, they're going to go ahead and hook. And I actually would get the um, femur back, please, to show this. They're going to be able to hook um, their ligament over the top of this trochlear ridge. So can you see here on this medial trochlear ridge? So this is the outside of the bone. This is the inside one. Can you guys see that there's a little notch right there? 
Okay, now that little notch, okay, we've got our patellar ligaments that are sitting here and it, inside my hand would be the patella itself. When this is moved, when the joint is moving, these patellar ligaments are going to be able to slide and they're gonna be able to slide with a um, muscle called your TFL, tensor fascia lata, that's going to lift the um, ligaments structure up and be able to flow over the joint surface and that's a normal moving stifle. When the or sleeps, they're going to literally hook their ligament structure inside that little notch, and that's what's going to help them sleep. So the stay apparatus is a very important part of any horse's um, natural movement and mobility. But the neat thing about it for a horse is what's called stored energy. So when a horse goes to walk, okay, they're going to, of course, place that foot on the ground. The weight bearing is going to go over the leg itself. And at that point, the body is going to start to store some energy. The ligamental structure, and I brought this little, um, this little prop for you guys to kind of visualize this. Okay, so here's just a little piece of mesh. The ligamental structure, as it gets stretched out, is going to pull, obviously, but just like an elastic, it is going to store energy. Well, you guys know what happens with an elastic when you let it go, it snaps back, right? And the leg does the same thing because of this stay apparatus. So as the leg is retracted backwards, it's storing energy in that stay apparatus, okay? When the toe goes to come off the ground, the first movements of your horse's hind leg is all stored energy, okay? So that leg snaps forward from stored energy. It's not until the leg is off the ground and starts to come underneath the plane of the pelvis that the quadricep muscles and your hip flexor muscle are going to come into play to be able to bring that leg forward and further underneath the body to then sit down and the whole process starts again, okay? This is really important to you horse owners out there. Probably, and I'll let the gals give me a nod or not, but probably at least 50% of the horses that we would see daily are using only stored energy to be able to move their hind limbs. Those are the horses that they're both nodding like this, maybe higher, maybe higher. Those are those horses where you see them, the leg comes off the ground, the toe kind of drags just a little bit, the toe, does, the flight path of the leg isn't very high, um, the leg lands into the ground toe first, okay? Now we've got some top performance horses to show you today, so we might not see that exact thing, but we do have a nice video with, uh, with a horse that had a little bit of problems that is showing this. The toe comes into the ground first because the quadricep muscles and your hip flexor muscles did not take the actual weight of the leg and continue that flight path forward. And that's an absolutely critical thing because if that those muscles are not functioning, that's where your SI joint starts to take more torque than it needs to. That's where your joints within your leg are taking more torque than they need to. Because the leg is coming into the ground prematurely, and it didn't have a full flight path to be able to slow the leg down before it hits the ground, all of the forces that are hitting into the ground are going directly into your joint surfaces. So absolutely critical that we teach you guys how to recognize what's happening with your horse's hind limbs. Okay, so now we're going to break and go into Cassidy's uh, part of the um, presentation, and we're just gonna talk about some symmetry. Yeah. Tina did a fantastic job talking about the biomechanics and the anatomy of the hind limb. And so now that we have that understanding of what's underneath and the movements that we're looking for, now I'm going to give you guys some questions and some tools to take back to your horses so that you can start looking at them and noticing those subtle differences side to side and evaluating the symmetry from their left side to the right side as well as the top to the bottom. So naturally, there might be some asymmetry side to side because just like people, they have a dominant side that they like to use a little bit more. Um, however, we want to do our best to minimize it and recognize it early 
before those asymmetries develop into a much bigger issue. These asymmetries can lead to things like muscle soreness, to hot, like poor postural habits. I myself know that I, I tend to stand like this and it leads to asymmetries throughout the entire body because again, with anatomy, everything's connected. So it's really important. We want to notice for muscle compensation, we want to notice these asymmetries because then it can lead to unnatural forces happening down through the limb and therefore in the future over time lead to pain, injury, and degenerative conditions. So a couple tools when we're evaluating symmetry side to side, we want to do it both statically when the horse is standing still as well dynamically when the horse is moving. So to start off, we want to look at the horse's hip and maybe we'll grab the bones again so people have a really great visual. Um, so we wanna look at things like the horse's posture. So this again, fantastic horse standing nice and square. We wanna recognize over time, if our horse tends to balance or rest the same foot continually, we want to recognize if our horse likes to stand with one leg forward and underneath them. Again, noticing these little postural changes, it's one thing for them to just stand like that for a second or two to, to offload that leg, but if they're constantly in that same posture, we need to maybe look a little bit deeper of why that's happening and why that's their comfortable position and what position that they are avoiding. Um, other things that we can look for, if we bring the uh, pelvis here, we want to look for hip level. So there's a couple different points, and I'll show you on the horse afterwards, that we want to look at. So we want to look at our coxal tuberosity on the side. If one side's going to be, here, I'll do it this way. If one side's going to be higher or lower, we're going to look up at our sacral tuberosities. Again, noticing if there's a difference in height. And again, from behind the horse, we want to notice if there's a difference in height or if one side is forward um, in the ischial tuberosities. So Tina is doing a fantastic job here of putting on some stickers, which will be a great visual for you guys at home. So the easiest way that I like to evaluate our pelvis is from behind. Again, taking your own safety into consideration um, and knowing your own horse, right? We want to first and foremost notice um, our own safety. So we're going to look from behind the horse. We're going to see if one hip is higher than the other. And again, it might be harder to see at home, um, but I highly recommend that you guys get some stickers um, or chalk and mark the bony landmarks on your horse. And it gives you a great little visual, especially when we get into the dynamic movement, there we go, um, to see those changes. Another really important consideration when we're evaluating, especially the hind end and the pelvis, is that our horse is standing square. If they are standing with one leg under, and we're, we're, trying. <laughs> we're trying our best here. Uh, <laughs> if they are standing with one leg uh, stretched out or one leg underneath, it will not give you an accurate reading. So do take the time to, to get them square. And also they have to be four on the floor, weight bearing on both sides. There we go. So again, we're gonna look at our ischial tuberosities at the back to see if they're nice and level. We're gonna look up to our sacral tuberosities, noticing if there's a difference in height um, there. And then looking on the um, coxal tuberosities on the side. To, and comparing left and right of, is there a difference in height? Is there a difference in forward and back? Um, there we go, it's falling off. So that's a really easy way, oh, and we lost a stick. <laughs> really easy um, way to evaluate your horse's pelvis. All right, we're losing old ones for a second. Then we can look while we're back here, we can look down our horse's limb and again, looking side to side to see the similarities and the differences. So common areas I like to look at when evaluating a horse is the inner thigh. Is one side bigger or smaller than the other side? 
do is there a difference in how each feels does one side feel taut and tight and the other side feel more jelly like um moving down we'll look at our hawks is there a difference in height is there a difference again tina did a great uh, little talk there of how they toe out slightly does one side toe out or toe in more than the other side the other thing to consider is is there any change in size or shape of the hawk left to right is there any swelling uh, on one side compared to the other and then we continue this uh, evaluation down through the whole limb so looking through our suspensories are do they feel the same do they look the same is there any swelling and taking those same principles all the way down to our caster and also looking at our coronet band um, on either hind leg again it's really important to mention that if you do discover a significant asymmetry whether that is a swelling or um, a, a large difference in your muscle tone side to side it's really important to get your equine professional team of veterinarians body workers uh, all involved to help create a plan for you and your horse a little, little gas break that's okay the other thing is um, that we're looking for is our muscle definition, our muscle tone in our hips, in our quads. Do they feel the same? Is there any differences side to side? And that goes all the way down our hamstrings as well. So those are kind of basic things to look for when your horse is standing still. Then we can start to evaluate how our horse uh, works dynamically. And so first thing we'll look at is, does either side activate the same? And we'll get more into the activate, activations here soon. Um, but when we activate our quad, does it activate the same on the left side as it does on the right side? Then we can get the horse moving. And I think Tina did a great job of getting some markers for you guys to see. So we'll go straight down and back. We'll evaluate the horse from behind first. Hold on, Kim, for a second. I'll tie this up. And I think Cassidy had a very good point when she was speaking about the static um, evaluation. Uh, that we're going to look at the structure of the horse. But remember, if one side's smaller, it doesn't always mean that it's weaker. It could also mean that that side is much tighter and being pulled over a tighter surface area. So, you know, as Cassidy was pointing out there and we were, you know, looking to see if we had the same shape and same definition on both sides. When you see one side that's not quite the same shape, um, and you're looking at depth here we can see on this little guy before we move her we can see that she doesn't quite have the same shape in her gaskin on either side she's a little rounder through this side and a little rounder through the inside of this leg a little flatter through here and a little flatter through here on this side so if Pete gets a good yeah I can see it really good there in the camera um so, you know, just because you see one side that looks smaller or flatter, remember, that might not be our weak side. That might be that we have one side that's pulled over a tighter surface area. So Cassidy, as she explains the movement here, we're just going to make sure that we go back and forth so that people are, are really seeing, you know, where the weakness is and, and where it's just structure. For sure. Uh, great point. Um, so before we actually get lovely Coco here moving, a uh, couple tips for when we are evaluating our horse dynamically. Sometimes it can get totally overwhelming. So I always tell people to break it down uh, and we'll do it a couple, couple times just so you guys can really get a good view. And we'll also have a video available that you guys will, will walk through after. Uh, and ultimately it takes a lot of practice. So first things first is we'll break it down into certain points. Again, looking at the whole picture can sometimes get slightly overwhelming. So, and it depends on how you like to do things, but I like to look at the bottom, bottom up. Uh, some people like to go top down. 
So for the sake of ease, we'll just focus on our hot stickers. Again, we're watching for symmetry side to side. So is one hawk lifting higher than the other? Is one hawk moving more forward than the other? Is there a lateral movement on one hawk compared to the other? Um, again, just noticing those similarities and differences in that horse's flight path and picking uh, one area at a time. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll walk here. And we're paying attention to see if she picks up one side higher, if there's more swing to the left or to the right, we have a little bit of an obstacle. And you can turn around, or we can follow you actually. And then we'll have a dual vision. And then moving up, we lost our stickers on the back, but we're gonna look up at our uh, coxal tuberosities on our hip, as well as our sacral tuberosities on the top as she moves. Again, watching to see if uh, like one side of the hip moves higher than the other, if one side of the hip drops or swings out. Again, noticing those different side to side. So whenever you're ready, I'll step in front of you to quite see. And again, this takes a lot of practice. There we go, turn it around. It takes a lot of practice to notice those subtleties and you'll get to know your horse the best. First stop, sorry about that, everybody. No worries. Those ones are a little better. Yeah. Our first dots weren't strong enough. <laughs> a little more visual. Yeah. Too shiny, exactly. Perfect. Other things that we can notice, we have her, her tail tied so that you can see. Um, noticing if the tail swings one way or she likes to hold it to one side, it can be an indicator of other things happening in the pelvis. So we'll do one more walk nice and slow here um, to get a good visual of our ischial tuberosities. Again, watching for significant changes in height. Um, again, if one mo is moving more forward and back, uh, and then once we're done this one, we'll view her from the side. So one more. And again, she might be holding her tail to the, to the right, and that might just be because of how we have it tied. Um, but it is a good thing to kind of write down in a little bit of a notebook to see, and then you can share that with your equine professional team uh, to see if that also gives them any clues. So those are kind of the main things to look for from behind. Again, our sacral tuberosities, our coxal, coxal tuberosities, and our ischial tuberosities, and then down through our joints, uh, down the limb. Next, we can evaluate our horse from the side. Again, watching to, see our horse's hind end flight path. Is their hind foot stepping into at least the footprint of their front end? Is both legs elevating the same? Is, are they getting the same extension or range of motion both forward and back on their left leg as they are on their right? And again, you might need to do these uh, walks a few times. I also highly recommend videotaping your horses being walked in a straight line, and then you're able to really slow it down so you can analyze uh, your horse's movement and those subtle uh, asymmetry side to side. So we'll have, we'll have her walk and we'll view it from the side watching our hind end. Excellent. So again, the best ways to, to kind of assess symmetry on our horse statically uh, and dynamically, it's super important because then we can help minimize our horse's risk of injury as well as maximizing their potential 
We can share all of this information with our equine professional team, and we can notice those little changes in performance before they escalate. So uh, I hope you guys all take a chance to, to look, from, look at your horses at home and notice those little differences side to side. So we'll pass it off here to, to Kim again and Tina, and we'll talk about the video that we'll be showing on your screen here shortly. Okay. Yeah, really well done, Cassidy. Thank you so much. So if we could get the team at AEF to go ahead and put the video up that we prepared, that Kim prepared for um, the presentation. Okay, guys, so the interesting thing about watching this video is we're going to look through the things that uh, you guys can go ahead and play that video. Um, you're going to see that the best way to look at a horse, like Cassidy mentioned, is to put that horse in a box. So if you just press pause on that video for one second. Perfect. Thank you. So can everybody see on the screen there that we are looking at that horse and Kim's done a very good job of drawing that box or that um, uh, rectangle shape around the horse. And for me, this is the best way for you guys to be able to visualize what's happening with that um, horse and um, what they are actually doing um, within that rectangle shape. So the interesting thing about the rectangle shape is that it gives you guys then some parameters to watch the um, actual structure. So Cassidy did a great job of speaking through the structure on the live horse. And we're going to tell you what we're seeing on this horse in a second um, so that you guys can try to train your eye a little bit. But the nice thing about having this video available, and I know the link um, is uh, on our YouTube channel, so you guys can go ahead and watch it as many times as you would like. Um, but by putting the um, parameters around it, it really starts to train your eye to see which direction the pelvis is going. When we start this video again, um, and we uh, talk through it a little bit, you'll see that this horse that's in the video, or even where they've paused it right now, you'll see that the right hip is slightly lower and it wants to go a little bit further forward. Sometimes those things get lost in time and space if we don't uh, make ourselves some parameters to look at to see what's happening with that horse. And you guys at home might be saying, oh my goodness, Tina and Kim and Cassidy, I'm not going to go home. I, I, this is making no sense to me. Why are you even want me, wanting me to do this? It's because of the forces that the horse's um, back, pelvis, and hind leg are taking when you start to add speed. So if we can see asymmetries at the walk, and when we are looking at the actual pelvic structure itself, um, and we're going to work our way down here in a second, but when we see an asymmetry through there, then as your horse goes to push off and use that leg, it, the forces are going to go asymmetrically through the pelvis, asymmetrically through that SI joint, through the lumbar vertebrae, into the forehand of the horse. And because of course that horse is a quadruped and those front legs are coming down as well, it's going to put an equal load on the front legs as well. So that's why it's so important for you guys to take the time and go ahead and, and video your horse or start to train your eye and watch in real time to see what's happening with that horse. So if you guys um, at the gals at AEF could continue that video and press play on that guy again. So this horse is going to turn around and come back towards us here. Um, and if we look at the pelvis, because this horse's head is nice and low, if you look at the top of the pelvis from the um, front view here, you can really see that that left side is creeping up higher than the right side. And here that horse is going to go and move away from us again at the trot. And do you notice that at the trot, if the AEF group could pause it right there, um, if you notice at the trot there, all of a sudden, the pelvis now is fitting in the box a little bit better. And this happens a lot with horses. So as speed is increased, the horse tends to bring their body closer together. 
you guys have probably done this with your own body. You have something that's sore. And what you try to do is you try to hold it close to the body to protect it. And the horse does the same thing. The horse is going to try to bring anything that's sore in towards the midline to try to protect that region. And that's really important for you guys to notice because even when we um, go ahead to watch uh, Coco go here, um, she does have one leg that's a bit weaker and you guys might have already picked that up in, uh, in Cassidy's part of the talk as, as she was uh, talking you through it. But when we get her into the trot, you guys are going to see that she actually gets quite square behind. And that happens with a lot of horses. So that's why you see body workers and veterinarians uh, when we're doing our initial evaluations, really wanting to see the horse both at the walk and the trot to see where that horse is going to compensate and bring themselves together to try to um, still have the locomotion and the added speed. So that's an important point to think about. So that video that um, Kim prepared for you guys with the box around is going to be what I want you guys to start to visualize when we watch Coco go here. So Cassidy, if you could turn her back around. All right. So if we bring um, Pete and the camera here to right behind her once again, and if we just try to have her a little bit more square, doesn't have to be perfect, but just a little bit, just so that we can make sure that people are looking in the right place. So gang, we're gonna start this evaluation by looking right here at the top. So I've marked off your sacral tuberosities here with some little tags. And um, we've marked off your coxal tuberosities with the little tags. And what we want you to do, this is our gluteal muscle, this round muscle that's right here, okay? We want you to look at this gluteal muscle as the horse moves away from you. And we'd like you guys to try to see, is one side popping up more than the other? And as Cassidy mentioned, is one side going further forward more than the other? And let's see what this horse is gonna tell us with her soft tissue. And this time when the horse goes, we'll try to talk it through a little bit. Walk. Just walk to start. Okay, gang, if Pete follows behind as best as he can, this is a big moving horse. Can you guys see that the right hip is going further forward than the left? And do you see that those two top sacral tuberosity tags, so I'm going to point those out because we're going to watch this one more time. Did you guys see that these two little tags were going over to the left each time she moved? Now this horse is perfectly sound. There's absolutely nothing wrong with her soundness, but she's got a little asymmetry, as Cassidy mentioned, as we all do, right? None of us are perfectly symmetrical, but this is something that these guys work on all the time. And they are very aware that if they don't stay on top of this, this situation can actually get worse and then work its way down into a possible problem. So I want you guys to really focus on these two as we turn around and watch one more time. And I want you guys to watch how those go further to the left than they come here to the right. Okay, so subtle, of course, because this horse is ridden very well and in top shape, but definitely there, okay? Again, doesn't mean that we've got a um, uh, pathological lameness or a problem, but this is an asymmetry that this horse is carrying. Now we're gonna do it at the trot, and hopefully Pete can keep up here and see, see if we can keep you guys uh, zoomed into this horse, but we're gonna see what changes at the trot. Good luck to you. Same yeah, let's try the same direction. Okay. Good girl. That's okay. So did everybody notice that the little tags moved way less when she was in the trot than when she was in the walk, okay? Now, of course, the walk is a four-beat gait, and we do have a little different movement through the pelvis, 
versus the trot, which is a two beat gait, uh, diagonal pairs. So of course the body has to pick up just a little bit more. But very interesting that when she's in the walk, you see such um, a, like a greater amount of movement than you do when she's in the trot, okay? So the next thing we want you guys to look at then is these coxal tuberosities. That's going to be these side guys. Because when she walks, you're going to see that one goes slightly further forward. And we really want you to pick this out. These little tags are just a little piece of tape. And you guys can make these super easy, easily at home um, just by going ahead and making a little flat tag and then a spot to stick it down on. Really helps you to be able to see what's happening. So this time, let's watch these side guys as this horse moves away from us. I have to walk to start. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So on those ones there, oh, sorry, but I'm banging into you. On those ones there, okay, did we see there that, you know, she goes slightly further um, forward on the right hand side, and we see a little bit of a drop um, on that left side, which makes sense because we saw the top ones going off to the left. So her having that little bit of a drop on the left hand side is how that pelvis is, is moving in the body, okay? Now, if we can, we're gonna watch those two guys at the trot and see what kind of change we have. You can't see him moving, it's too small. Yeah, let's try one more time. Pete says that the Zoom, it's hard to see on the Zoom, but let's try it. Good girl. Yeah, hard to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Kim's saying take her word for it. Um, so did everybody notice there um, when she went to trot? Now Pete's saying as he's looking through the viewfinder, he's finding it hard to see. So you guys at home might be as well. A um, little easier to see in, in real time if you're at home doing this. So um, humor us and stick these stickers on and see if it works for you guys at home. But if you were able to see if you have a big enough screen at home, um, you would have noticed that we had less of a shear moving forward as this horse was um, uh, moving, or her, as her pelvis was moving forward in the trot, okay? Um, the ischiatic ones are gonna be hard to see because as Kim had mentioned, this little sweetheart brings her tail slightly to the right, doesn't she? And when the tail goes slightly to the right, it's going with our pelvis that wants to shear off a little bit to that left-hand side. So remember what our job of our tail is, everybody. That is a rudder, right? So this is our balance point of the actual horse itself. So if the pelvis is off to the left, then my rudder has to go to the right to be able to help balance myself, okay? So that's why we're seeing that this dot is getting um, covered up when she's moving, because she is using her, her tail to help her balance through her mobility. But I do think we will be able to see pretty clearly the um, marks on her hocks. So let's go ahead and watch that at the walk and the trot and see what changes with that, because you're gonna notice one's higher than the other. Okay, Cassidy, just the walk to start. Okay, perfect. So did you guys notice that when she's moving, Coco, do you see me? Not a girl. Um, that when she's moving, we're seeing here that we are getting a little bit more height on our right side and a little bit more um, under the body or medial with the left side. So she's holding that left side a bit in and she's getting a little bit more height on her right hand side, okay? Going with us having a little bit less muscle tone that Cassidy had pointed out when we were looking at her statically from behind. So let's see, it. oh, and the other thing I wanted to note on that um, hawk was did you see that she had a little bit of wobble through the hawk? So when the hawk landed on the ground, we saw just a little bit of wobble through there, okay? Meaning that we don't have quite equal forces coming through the leg because we do have that pelvis just a little bit off to the side. So again, because this horse is so well cared for, 
um, and she works at a really high level, this is, this is being managed all the time. But you'll see on some of the horses that you get to see go, their hawk wobble will actually literally look like their whole hind leg is rotating. So that's something to really pick up. Okay, let's see. I know it might go fast at the trot and Pete's trying to run along behind. So let's just see. I know Zoom, Zoom um, lectures are a little bit hard to get through, but let's see if we can, what we can see when we trot. Oh, in the video. Okay, perfect. We'll mention that. Perfect. Okay, perfect. It's actually quite good. Okay, because this horse is so athletic. We're not seeing what we had mentioned before where the, the toe drags to the ground and she hits toe first. She definitely comes up and through and um, these guys are strengthening her quads really well. So we're seeing that we do have full flight paths with that leg, um, but we do see just a little bit of asymmetry through those hawks as well. Kim was just mentioning to me um, as we were turning the horse around that on the video, there's some pretty significant hawk wobble on the horse that is noted in the video and the toe drag as well. Um, so uh, we'll pop back to that video in one second to be able to um, uh, talk through that and be able to show you guys that. Um, pelvis hip. Okay, I think that's it for this guy um, for mobility. Oh, the, from the front view so that they can look at the top. So we're actually going to get Pete in front of the horse at the moment because we want you guys to do one more thing at home. So we've got a little five part checklist for you. So I don't know, Pete, if you're going to be able to walk backwards as she walks towards you. This might be hard. So guys, what we're going to look for here is, okay, we're going to try to look for the tops of these hips as she walks forward. So we're going to try our best again, so much easier with a live lecture, but we'd really like for you guys to look at these um, tops of those gluteals. We want to see how those are moving as she comes forward towards us. And again, we want to send you home with these little five points to be able to look at. So I don't know, are you going to be able to walk? Yeah, try it. Okay, so let's give it a try. Let's see if you guys can watch this. Pete's going to do his best here. Oh, she's so good. Good girl. Okay. Yeah, look at us go. We could be a camera crew. You guys. <laughs> Okay, so can you guys really clearly see that we had much different muscle contraction from side to side? So we're really seeing that uh, the front of that right side bulge up um, as the pelvis is rotating there to the left. So very interesting um, pelvis. Again, perfectly sound horse, horse is working excellent, doing very well but just has these things that we're always working towards. So as Kim had mentioned, I think what we'll do is we will get the gals at AEF to bring that um, video back up and we'll just see some significant hawk wobble to be able to talk you through that. And we'll get our, we'll get our iPad for that here as the AEF girls are bringing it up. Okay, I'll just see. I'm sorry, we have to go back and forth. I just have to look where AES at. Okay, perfect. We're at the exact same spot. Okay, perfect. Okay, guys, if you want to go ahead and um, if the AEF gals can press play on that. And you guys are watching that horse come towards us right now. Okay, now here's where we get to see that toe first landing from the side. So we're seeing that horse land toe first. Both hind legs um, definitely landing toe first and quite stilted versus the Coco horse we have in front of us today with a full flight path. This is an excellent example, the horse that's in the video, of a horse that is just using his stay apparatus to spring the leg forward. You can see that the toe drags at times 
and that the um, foot doesn't come all the way forward for a heel first landing. So again, this horse having some pathologies that's in the video, and it was at the vet clinic at Energy Equine to get these things um, looked at. So um, not that this the horse that's on the video is overtly, thank you so much, is overtly lame by any means, um, but just showing the difference in that hind leg mobility. Okay. I to know too, um, it's buffering a little bit for them through the Zoom, but it will be, it is on the YouTube channel, so they can watch it in real time. Perfect. They want to Perfect. So we'll make sure that you guys have that YouTube link if you did want to watch that video again and again to really help train your eye, especially because Kim did such a nice job of putting the um, uh, rectangle shape around that um, the video with that horse. Okay. Okay, guys. So let's go ahead then and go into. Um, our talk about the difference between activations and stretches. We really wanted you guys to start to train your eye to look at your horses at home. But even more than that, we wanted to be able to send you guys home with something that's safe to do on every sound horse um, that does not have any kind of pathology. Now, if your horse has a pathology or has had um, hawk injections, any other type of injections, has some arthritis, make sure that you ask your veterinarian or body worker that you work with to be able to know if these are safe and appropriate for your horse. But we did go ahead and choose three activations and three stretches that are safe for any healthy horse. Now, the first thing that we need to talk about um, is safety. We need to make sure that your horse is comfortable to be worked around, that you're working on a firm, flat surface, that the horse is not gonna slip or fall during any of these activations. You also have to be comfortable with your horse's hind end, and the horse has to be comfortable with you working with the hind end. So if, none, if any of those boxes are not being checked off, make sure that you double check um, that either you get some training for your horse or you double check with your um, uh, health professional to see if there is uh, anything that could be modified. Because we are showing you the full activations and stretches in this presentation, um, but some horses might not be able to do the entire stretch or struggle with the stretch and they could be modified to make it so that your horse could benefit from it. So um, if you don't have a body worker, we would definitely be happy to help you here at InHunt um, to be able to understand if these would work for your horse or not. So big question of the day, what are activations and what's the difference between those and my stretches? Activations are where you're actually activating your horse's nervous system. You're trying to wake up the area that we are working with, in this case, the hind end, uh, SI, stifle, pelvis, and lower limb, um, and that you're trying to get the horse's awareness there. I always use this example. If you guys break your left leg, you'll be standing on your right leg waiting for it to heal. Once it's healed, six weeks goes by, you get your cast off, you still stand this way because in about three days um, from breaking your leg, you've created a new normal. You guys know how it is. You hurt yourself the first night trying to sleep is agony because you keep moving it, it keeps going in a spot that makes it hurt, and all night long you're aware of your leg. Well, in about three or four, three or four days, now of course, if you have some kind of other nerve damage or something, it might take you more than three or four days. But usually the nervous system starts to normalize in about three or four days from most things. In three or four days, you can figure out how to sleep. You know how to move your leg. You know how to get out of bed in the morning. You know how to do all those things because your nervous system has normalized to this leg not working the same. You've learned how to move your weight bearing over to your right side. You've learned how to overuse this right side and to stabilize yourself so you're not just tipping over, okay? You've, you've learned all those things and you do that through no conscious effort. Your nervous system does that for you, okay? This is now your new normal. In six weeks, this leg is healed. You don't just snap right back to be standing right in the middle and weight bearing this leg all the way, okay? 
Unfortunately, your body thinks that this is your new normal. And you rest like this, you stand like this, even though supposedly this leg is back to normal. So activations are what we do to try to retrain the nervous system that it can use both sides the same, okay? We're going to make sure that when we do activations, we do them in a rocking rhythmic fashion because the nervous system turns muscles on and off and if it does so in a rhythmic pattern, it starts to retrain that muscle that wasn't turning on to be able to activate and turn on the same as the opposite side that had been taking all the weight. So activation sometimes are even more important than stretches when you have one side of your body that's not working the same as the other. So really important to realize the difference between stretching and activating. Activations are normally done before you ride because we want to turn on the body from side to side and we want both sides of the body to be able to um, recognize and have the muscles firing at the same rate. And you're going to notice, and even with our friend Coco here when we start some activations, you're going to notice she's a little bit slower on one side. Once we do the activations enough times, both sides will be turning on exactly the same. We really want that turn on to occur before you guys get on the horse. So your activation exercises that the three of us are gonna share today need to be done before you start your um, ride for that day. And they need to be done very rhythmically. Versus stretches. What is the point of the stretch? The stretch is to elongate the muscles, okay? So everybody that eats red meat knows that when they cut into red meat, they see those striations or the muscle fibers that are in a muscle itself. Within those striations is where the nutrients come in, the waste products are released, and all of your um, lymphatic tissue is flowing through as well, okay? Those muscle striations, when they contract and release during exertion, okay, start to build up waste products within there. If the lymphatic system is very efficient, it'll take those waste products away and you won't have anything left for the next day. But how many of you guys have done a workout where the next day you're like, oh my God, I can hardly move, I can hardly function? And that's because your lymphatic system wasn't uh, efficient enough. It didn't drain out all your waste products. And what are you left with in there? Enzymes, lactic acid, among others, okay? And that's what makes you stiff and sore the next day. If we have a muscle that wasn't efficient enough, and we went ahead and elongated the muscle after we worked it, we literally milk out those waste products and really try to allow then that muscle to be as clean as possible. We help to aid the lymphatic system in drainage and we help to start to elasticize the muscle structure and the tendinous structure, connective tissues that run through that muscle structure. Stretches are meant to be done um, once or twice, and I'm sure you guys have done this with your own body. You stretch one area, and then you release it, and the next time you stretch it, you're able to stretch it way further than the first time, okay? So we like to do the stretches, a couple of them in a row, but stretches are a thing that we're going to stretch and do a hold time on, okay? So it's important that we get that hold time in versus an activation that's done in a rhythmic pattern for more repetitions in a row. So today we're gonna to start with Kim. She's gonna walk us through, we're gonna do our three activations and then we'll show you guys our three stretches that we want you to take home to your horse. So I'll pass it over to Kim and I will let her uh, do her first activation. Okay, I'll try for a bit. Maybe we'll just move her. Yeah, where would you like to be? Um, I'll just move her towards feet. Okay. Got a good girl. Okay. So okay. the first activation we're going to do, um, we call the caudal tail pull. Now this is an activation um, I really like to uh, pass on to owners as often as I can if it's appropriate for the horse. Most times it is, but the reason being Today we're focusing on hind limb. However, this is something, an activation that will actually affect the entire length of the body. 
So it's a, it's a key, key, key one to do. A couple of safety things, of course, you always want to make sure, as Tina had mentioned, the horse is really used to being um, handled from behind because you have to stand directly behind the horse for this. It needs to be you square. You can't be off to the side because we don't want uneven pull on it. Um, and then the other thing is we want to have the horse as square as possible because, as Tina had mentioned, that tail that we're going to be using is actually their rudder. It's how they maintain their balance. So if we are going to be using that and we're taking a little bit of that away from them, then of course we don't want them to be unstable and fall down. So as square as possible, um, just of course, let your horse know that you're here. If this is the first time and you're not sure if your horse is gonna be comfortable, you can always grab the tail to start with, swing it around, just see how used to it they are. Now we know with this mare, because this is one that Tina um, has worked on for many, many years and is, um, as uh, knows the the owners very well and knows that they're what they have been doing with her she's used to this so i'm feeling very comfortable to be behind her so again then i might have pete come behind as well so he can see what we're going to have you do is you're going to kind of stand in a little bit again this is for your own safety as well so that if you're standing square here like this and something were to happen you're not as easily able to move quickly whereas if you're standing in a little bit of a scissor you can quickly push off and get out of the way should something happen the horse spook or whatnot okay you want to take the horse's tail nice and loose she can see she's super super comfortable with this you're just going to place your hand right underneath the tail of the horse um, the head of the tail the other part you're going to just slide your hand down until you no longer feel that vertebrae you're now just holding on to the hair itself the areas we're going to look at when we do this is the very top here of this hamstring muscle we call the biceps femoris okay this is where that muscle inserts onto um, the, the actual vertebral column then you're also going to have these areas here which is the top of your gluteals those are the areas we're going to focus on because that's what we're going to look for for that activation, that nervous system stimulating. One thing to be very cognizant of, because you do have the horse's spinal cord in your hand, you do not want to make this an overtly enormous movement. You want to have those quick rhythmic tugs, as Tina had mentioned. Because again, it is the spinal cord. So we have to be very, very careful. We've seen some um, horrific videos of people doing this inappropriately where they're leaning back on the tail and that's not okay. <laughs> so as I said, you're just gonna hold the tail in this fashion, you nice and loose with your own body and we're gonna give a quick tug with the, with the bottom hand down here with the tail. This one here is just for guidance. I'm gonna give a tug, and a tug. You can see already this left side here is starting to jump. This right side here, not so much just yet, but we're just gonna keep up with our little tugs. And there it goes. Now you can start to see that right side. So it took about, in her case, 10 tugs before we started to see activation on this right side as well as this left side. But that's exactly what you're looking for um, when you're doing this activation. Oh, oh yeah, can't see. <laughs> and I think we might also note in there that when you're starting activations, we would start at a Could you try again? We would start at about 10 reps and we would actually try to build up till we get to 30 to 50 reps. And I know 50 sounds like a lot, but some horses, now as Kim had mentioned, this horse is very used to these exercises. She's been um, working with exercises for years. Um, so she is um, well equipped to get that activation you guys saw after about three to five that she was starting to normalize on both sides. Um, some horses, it'll take up to 30 tucks before you even see symmetry starting on both sides. And you might need 30 to 50 before they actually look like both sides of that hamstring tissue is jumping up. So really note that uh, when you're looking at your own horse. Make sure that you don't stop until you see equal activation from side to side. And if you get to 50 reps of that before you see equal activation, 
that would be an indication to call your equine professional and to get an assessment done of what's happening. Fantastic. So to build off what Tim had just talked about of our caudal tail pull, this second activation is a lateral tail pull. So again, caudal meaning we're pulling back and lateral we're going to pull to the side. So similar to what Tina and uh, no right here. Um, similar to what Tina and Kim have said is again safety consideration. This one, your horse needs to have four on the floor. They cannot be resting one hip or one leg. They have to be four on the floor and ideal as square as possible. Uh, safety considerations for yourself. Again, we're, we want to stand relatively close to the horse. We want to have good footwear in case when we do pull them lateral, sometimes they do take a step and you want to make sure you're not uh, in your nicest uh, heels. So again, we are going to have a similar position uh, with our hands on the tail that we had with Kim's activation, where our top hand is holding that dog and it's supporting it. But the pulling is not coming from that top hand. It's going to come from that lower hand where it's just hair. And again, we're aiming to this dimple of the stifle, which is really easy to see on most horses. So this is where our pull is being geared towards. And we're keeping our focus on our horse's quadricep muscles uh, through here for them to activate. So I'll do a couple here and you might be able to see with the lighting. And again, gentle rhythmic on off. And if they take a couple steps, that's okay. They might take a second to, to settle into them, but keep going. And again, we're watching that quad area if Tina wants to point. Activate or turn on and off. On and off. And again, repeating that 10, 20, 30 times as they get used to it. This one's a little bit more challenging to see the differences side to side because we can only work on one side at a time. So again, we go through keeping track in our mind how many we've done. And then we're going to switch to the other side to see if there's a difference. So again, we switch our hands. So our lower hand is where the pull is coming from, aiming for that dimple of the stifle and pulling on and off. And you might notice, it might be hard to see, this side has slightly weaker activations. It is a little more fluttery than the right hand side. So we're going to just keep going through until we get a more even activation throughout. Again, gentle and rhythmic is the most important here. We don't want to yank on it for one second one time and then five seconds another time, we want to be as rhythmic as possible. And there we go. It's starting to get a little more even compared to what we had on the other side. There we go. And now we'll pass it on to Tina's activation. Perfect. And actually, Cassidy, if you could keep doing that same activation, I just want Pete to come up here, oh, uh, maybe yeah. from this angle, and just see everything that's happening with the back. Because as we were speaking about before, when you're doing one thing with your horse's body, you're actually getting movement um, and range of motion in other areas of the body. So as Cassidy brings the tail to this side, we are closing the um, SI joint on the left-hand side. We're opening the SI joint on the right-hand side. And so we're affecting the top of the pelvis as well as the lumbar vertebrae. If he's able to come here to the front and look at the pectorals as Cassidy keeps doing that, you guys are going to see that we get pectorals that are turning on and off and on and off. Yeah, a great view. Oh, she took a step there. So we're also getting front end mobility um, as well as balance through the sternum and the thoracic sling. So when you're working one portion of your body, always remember that, there's, that there is other portions of the body that are being affected as well. And I think that's really important. That's great, Cassidy, thank you. 
Um, I think that's really important when you're looking at your horse because we want to be able to ensure that when you guys are working on your horses, you're visualizing, as Kim had mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, you're visualizing what's happening with the rest of the body. Um, making sure that if there is something happening, like for instance, the horse is diving its neck down as you do these exercises. He keeps moving and moving and moving in front. You can see that this horse, you know, kind of an hour and a half in the arena, she's starting to paw a little bit but she's not moving her neck she's not having to use her neck as leverage you don't see that her back is dropping down in any kind of pain response as we're doing these activation exercises so it's really important for you guys to look at the rest of your horse's body as you're doing these exercises for my activation if i could just get her a little bit more square kim i'm sure you're yeah perfect thank you um for my activation, I'm going to do tail rock. And I know for any of you guys that are in-hand clients, you probably have gotten the tail rock exercise quite a few times in your exercise regime because it is so important. We're just trying to get her to put weight on this <laughs> left hand. She says, you guys, I'm getting tired. Okay, will she take one step back or is this as best as we're going to go? Yeah, perfect. We'd love our horses to be as square as possible whenever we do our exercises. So we're always striving for that. Um, I'm going to take my hand in a cup shape. I'm going to go ahead and rest it right on the very top of the tail head. And this might be easiest for the viewers, Pete, from behind. Um, when I have my, my hand there, I'm going to make sure I don't migrate down the tail. I'm going to keep my hand right at the very top. I'm going to look down at the fetlock on my side and I'm going to pull to my side till the fetlock drops and push away till the other fetlock drops. And I'm going to do this tail rock exercise in a rhythmic pattern from side to side. Okay. And you guys are going to notice that she would much rather go to the right than she would come over here to the left. And that is part of the asymmetry that she's working with. And as we get into this exercise, it's going to get easier and easier for her because she's going to start to warm up through that core tissue and through her medial and lateral stabilizers. So not only am I getting the lateral surface of the stifle with this exercise, I'm getting my inner thigh tissue with this exercise, okay? I'm going to be able to get my hip flexor uh, tissue with this exercise. I'm gonna be able to get the top of my hamstrings and my lateral hip stabilizer. And when we get Pete to move forward, as we get her into this exercise, you're gonna see I'm gonna get my core tissue of my back as well. So here I go, I'm just gonna do a nice rhythmic pattern. I just have my left hand rest on her in case she was to lift her leg up at me, then I can feel that coming. But my big thing is just to rock back and forth. Now again, I've worked on this horse for a long time. You can see I can get a really great rock. She's looking out the window at the moment, but if she wasn't, you know, we would see that she starts to rock all the way up to her nose. There she goes through her neck can really see all the way forward how this rock is working its way forward, just like a snake, right forward, right to the tip of her nose. So we would love this rock to start to activate her entire body, and that would be ideal for us. Again, on a horse that you're just teaching this to, we're going to be looking at just 10 to 15 rocks. Um, if I had a horse that had some significant asymmetries and I was having a hard time pulling one direction or the other, I might continue that until I felt like both sides started to equalize. Um, if I had a horse that was really restricted, you know, and some of them are so restricted at the tail, they literally clamp it down when you go to work on them. I would do such mini ones. I'd just be doing like this, tiny, 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 till I built enough nervous system trust to allow them to really rock from side to side. As Cassidy had mentioned in her um, activation, they might step away from you. Um, and if they do, we're just gonna try our best to stay with them, allow them to settle again and start that rocking again. We really do need them to be standing with um, both hind legs equal on the ground. 
If they're a little scissored, that's fair enough, but as square as possible is going to give you the best benefit from your activation exercise. Okay, guys, we're gonna go into our uh, stretches now. Again, activations, just as a reminder, are gonna be done before your um, exercise um, regime. Your stretches are going to be done after your exercise regime. So I'll pass it over to Kim for our first stretch. Okay, so for the first stretch, we're going to deal with one of the major muscle groups, which is the hamstrings. So in your hamstrings, you have your big biceps femoris muscle that comes down this way and attaches down to what, the hock and then the semitendinosus and your semimembranosus, okay? So these are those really powerful muscles. They help bring that, that hind limb backwards, okay? So what we wanna do then to elongate and stretch it is we're going to actually bring that limb forward. As Tina mentioned, the horse needs to be warmed up in order to do this. I'm gonna talk it through first before I get down below. But essentially what we're going to do, we want to have that horse be able to flex that fetlock. We don't want to have that joint straight. So we are not going to grasp it from the toe. The other reason why you don't wanna grasp it from the toe is in case they lose their balance and they go down hard. And now all of a sudden your fingers are caught between the, the floor and the horse's foot. Um, the other, the, you do not want to grasp from the tendon because we don't want to be stressing that tendon at all. We're just going to cuff nicely in that fetlock. You want to keep the horse's hind limb basically in line with the front limb, okay? So the left hind to left fore. You want to also ensure that that hind limb is only about eight inches off the ground. We don't want to have it way up high, but we don't want to have it too low because if it's too low, they're going to want to just stamp their foot right back down. Again, having the horse stand as square as possible. And um, the other part for you then is to ensure that you are also in a safe manner. This is hard on a lot of people because it can really stress your lower back. So one of the ways you're going to get down is in this position here so that you're actually resting your forearm on your knee, okay? So this is going to be able to allow you to easily move without having to actually move from your lower back, okay? So I'll just have her, yeah, but I know we're being very good, Coco. You're so close, my friend. So for me, I prefer to stand in this way. You can do it from the other if you prefer. It's going to depend on your own body. For me though, I like to be this way because uh, it's just more comfortable for mine. So I'm going to ask for that hind leg. We're going to let her come to a relaxed area. We're going to keep that leg up. I'm now cupping that fetlock in line and I'm going to bring it to the point of resistance. No further, hold that, as Tina said, for about 15 to 30 seconds. It depends on how um, flexible they are. Then you're gonna allow her to come back. If you have a horse you're just starting this with and you need to, you can actually start with these just little circles to help warm it up. Then you're gonna go back for your second stretch and ask for a little bit further. Holding again for about 15 to 30 seconds. And then come back. So for each horse, you might need to start them slow. The key here is it's better to do the less amount inside on the air of caution and then slowly build the horse then just come in and think, we're gonna elongate and stretch this muscle and reef on it. Because you can do tearing if you pull too fast, too hard, but consistency is the key. So if you're able to do those little, little stretches consistently every day, you're gonna start to notice that they start to build up and then all of a sudden, you're gonna gain way more length than you thought possible. Perfect. So to pair along with uh, Kim's fantastic stretch, we're going to do a little bit of the opposite. So she was stretching our big hamstring muscles. This next stretch is our quadriceps stretch. So we're stretching our quads. We're stretching a little bit through our hip flexors. All of those big muscles 
that bring that leg forward. And in order to stretch those muscles out, we need to bring them back. So similar to what Kim said, consider your forces, um, body mechanics, where they're standing, four on the floor, nice and square, as we've said, and then your own as well. We do not want to stretch like this because you will only be doing one or two stretches and then your body will hurt. And the point of this lecture is to not also send you to the chiropractor or your body worker. So for this stretch, same thing, we'll pick up the leg as if we were, do as if we were going to pick out its feet and they might pick it up and we just relax it. But instead we're gonna bring it back. Again, our body position, nice and strong, supporting our back, the power's coming from our leg. And I like to support lower as well as support through the hawk. And we are going to make sure that our stretch is in line with the front body, as she said. It might help if you have somebody else uh, watching you to make sure you're not pulling out to the side or pushing inward um, because that changes the stretches that are, or the muscles that are being stretched. And again, we're, we're just gonna push that leg back, extending it behind us. And again, going to the point of resistance, not to the point where they snap their leg back. That's where you're hitting that stretch reflex, which is a protective mechanism. Um, and as Kim said, it's better to do a, short, a shorter stretch, or like a smaller stretch, I should say, um, for longer as opposed to a big stretch where you reef on it for half a second. So again, just kind of pushing to that point of resistance, holding and releasing, and then trying it again that little bit further. And again, we're not lifting up too high. We're hovering off the ground in that nice neutral position and then placing the foot down. Perfect. Okay, excellent. Two excellent stretches there for your lower limb. Um, I loved how the gals were speaking about making sure that you're watching for stretch reflex. I think that's what most people do incorrectly when they are doing their stretches is they try to go too far as both Cassidy and Kim had mentioned. But what does that do to the body? We should talk about that just a little bit. When we are trying to elongate a muscle, remember that we are trying to get those fibers to be able to milk those waste products out and elongate the connective tissue that is around them. If you had stretch reflex, it's actually an autonomic nervous system reaction that, as Cassidy mentioned, snaps the leg back for protection. Ooh. She says, Tina, your lecture is getting too long. Okay. They snap that leg back for protection. Um, when the body does that, unfortunately, the muscles turn on very quickly. And when that happens, you can actually spasm up some of the tissue that you were just trying to elongate. So I loved how both of the gals mentioned that. I see so many clients, and I'm sure these gals could say the same thing. Um, that, you know, they're saying, oh, my horse is just being bad. Give me your leg. You know, we're stretching. Sometimes we don't realize that, you know, a stretch for that horse might literally be just to there. That might be all that they can get to um, safely and effectively and be able to hold that stretch. I always use the funny example of when you guys have all probably been for a human massage and you know how they've done your neck and then they, they pick your head up and they're pushing it forward and they're trying to stretch out the back of your neck and it's starting to hurt and you're getting into stretch reflex. So you're pushing your head back against them and they're pushing your head forward. And I always joke and say, we're Canadian, right? So we don't say to them, it's too much. We just push back against them and hope they realize it's too much. Um, so remember that that could be what's happening in your horse's tissue. And the more you activate stretch reflex, the shorter and shorter that muscle is going to get. And you're actually um, uh, doing some damage uh, to that tissue as far as stopping it from being able to get rid of those waste products that we are really wanting to get um, to release from the body. So my stretch is going to um, be about the SI joints. So the girls have done the lower leg for you, stifle and hawk and all your big um, hamstrings and um, uh, protraction, retraction tissue. 
Um, we're going to now try to stretch out this SI joint. So we're going to do the pelvic stretch. And uh, lots of you guys have seen this before. And unfortunately, we get to see it done incorrectly a lot. So it's really why we wanted to talk this through quite specifically. I'm going to ask this horse to be able to tuck her hind end underneath, okay? And then we're going in for pelvic flexion. And then we're going to ask her to bring it forward for pelvic extension, okay? We've seen this out in the field way too many times, which when the girls and I were preparing this lecture, we really wanted to talk to everybody about this. We've seen it where people run their hands down the back of the horse's gluteals and you see the horse in a very ballistic fashion snap their pelvis um, forward like that and people say to us look at the great movement she has well remember what's happening with that SI joint remember that its job is stability a jaw a, a bone or pardon me a joint that is made for stability needs to stretch very slowly in order for you to actually get a stretch and a mobilization through the joint. Otherwise, the muscle structure that's surrounding it, because it's meant to be um, stabilized, are going to literally lock down and you can create more damage by working your horse's tissue that way. So I'm gonna do this very slowly. Lots of you guys are familiar with this, but I think the big take home from this is how slow it needs to be. I'd like you guys to place both hands up and we'll show you this from the side and behind so that you can see. So I have two hands up. I'm in the gluteal muscle, that nice round muscle. I just take my fingers and roll them in slightly and I'm gonna very slowly run my way down, nice and slow, and ask her to tuck her hip under, okay? Good girl. Okay, so she wiggled around a little bit. She's talking to us about, about this pelvis and we know that about her, okay? But did you guys notice how we made it very slow and we got a full range of motion, okay? So again, we're gonna do that again because remember we're gonna do all of our stretches at least twice. We're gonna then run down again. We're gonna go super slow. And now the joint's a bit warmer and she understands what I want. And she's coming and doing a nice pelvic tilt. Now, you guys might be noticing on the camera, and if we have Pete come from behind, you're gonna notice when she does this pelvic tilt that she's coming quite far to my side as she does the tilt. So let's do it again. And I'm pushing equally with both sides. And do you guys see that the pelvis is coming this way over towards me? Well, remember how she was walking. She was walking with her pelvis down to this side and rotated over to this side. So where does she have the muscle memory patterning when she does the stretch even? It's to come to this side. Now, if you're ever wondering when you're at home, is that just because of me? Make sure you turn, change sides, okay? And you try it with your hands um, the other way around and just see, was I stronger on one side? or is it really what my horse is doing? And you can see it doesn't matter what side I sit on, she wants to go that way. So if that's happening to you at home, because we do want to create symmetry with our stretches, I'm actually going to run my left hand down, okay, and just try to use my left hand till I have her straight, then apply more right hand to try to get it to come up equal. Okay, so very good example of a horse that you need to really read what's happening with your stretches to ensure that you're doing them balanced from side to side. Because if I was just going to mindlessly do her hind end tuck, I would just exacerbate the problem of her wanting that pelvis to go to the left hand side. So really read what's happening. And I think that is one of the big things that we really want clients to take home from our lectures as well as our uh, bodywork sessions with clients is to make sure that anything that we're asking you guys to do with your horses, you're trying to figure out how does my horse um, work through this exercise and is there anything that my horse is trying to tell me? So that's really important for you guys to understand what's happening, that we're going to go through a full range of motion but we're going to be looking at symmetry with that range of motion. Okay, so um, at this time, we would ask if there was any questions that came up um, through the chat. 
or if there was any questions regarding any of the exercises. Hi, Tina. Thanks so much for all this information. Um, so far, there aren't any questions in the chat, um, but I'm just going to give everyone a moment. Oh, here we have one. How often do you do the stretch activation exercises? Oh, that's a fantastic question. So if uh, for sure every time that you're riding, now if you're a rider that doesn't maybe ride as much as you would like to, or you're at a barn right now with the COVID situation and you don't have the availability to um, work with your horse as much as you want, you can definitely take your horse for a 10 minute hand walk um, and once you've done that hand walk, you can do the activation stretches, or pardon me, the activations and the stretches, um, especially if you have an area that you're really trying to target and make changes to. So we would recommend that you would do your um, activations and stretches every time you ride. Um, and you can definitely add them to a program, even on those days that you're not riding. The only um, caveat to that is, is the horse does have to be warm. So we do have to make sure that you do that eight to 10 minute hand walk in the summer, maybe up to 15 minute hand walk if they were outside in the dead of winter to make sure that the tissue is warm enough to accept and get the most out of your activations and stretches. Awesome, and we had some other questions. Uh, that was the pelvic flexion. What is pelvic extension? Oh, rascally rabbit, that was my fault. Good question, whoever put that in there. They get, I, I call them sparkle points. So they get a sparkle point because I did, you're right, I did flexion, but I didn't do extension. Excellent. Okay, so we'll just get her standing back on this uh, left hind again. She's, she's getting a little tired. One more step. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so super. So we did the flexion, which is having our pelvis come into flexion. Now we're gonna extend it out. So it's the exact same thing. This time we're just gonna drag forward. So fingers up right behind the tallest part of your horse's croup. I like to start in behind. And we're literally going to just drag forward. I might be better if I go here so Pete can get so we're just gonna drag forward and see how that pelvis flattens out and look at this beautiful core tissue that's popping up in this horse. So drag forward and get that pelvis to come forward and hold. Nice, good girl. One more, okay. So back starting, I'll just, I'll just do a little flexion so she's flatter, there we go. Okay, and start behind the croup and drag forward. Yeah, beautiful. Good girl. Yeah, good question. So remember too, as the girls mentioned with their leg stretches, when you're doing your pelvic stretches, because they are a stretch, we would like that hold time in there. So we'd love to kind of start off with three to five seconds and work our way up to 30 to 45 seconds of hold time in both your flexion and your extension. Awesome, thank you. Um, another question, uh, um, sorry, will this help with the horse that is having issues loping? Really doesn't want to lope either side, but it will go easier on his right. Oh, 100%. So the interesting thing about the lope is they have to use a lot of pelvic flexion to be able to get the hind legs to come in and underneath the body. So um, both of the activations that, well, all three of the activations that we gave you will be absolutely critical. But the one that Cassidy showed with the lateral tail pull, making sure that the side of that stifle and your lateral hip stabilizer is turned on will actually um, help you to be able to get a horse that is tr has trouble with leads on one side versus the other. It'll also help you then because it's stretching out the uh, lumbar vertebrae and the SI, the front of the SI joint on the opposite side. It'll also help with some mobility in the lumbar, which then allows for more flexion when the horse goes to step into that loper counter gate. 
So these would be really great for that. And for whoever was brave enough to ask, uh, ask a question, I'll give you one more tip for your horse that doesn't want a, a lope or counter. Make sure you're doing a ton of Cavalettis, English or Western, that are at least mid cannon height. The reason we want that is because you want that full range of motion where we get flexion in the pelvis, quadricep um, activation as they step over those cavalettis. You need at least six to eight of them in a row to make a difference. You can do them in hand if your horse is just learning about them. You can do them on your horse's back if your horse is confident and you're confident with them. And you can get into the trot with them if your horse has enough fitness. So for that rider that's having trouble with loping or cantering, please make sure that you set out some big, some big uh, posts or build yourself some cavalettis and make sure that that horse is doing cavalettis every day. Awesome, thanks, so many tips. Um, how much pressure should you be using on those pelvic tilts? Oh, that's a great question. Only enough pressure to actually make the horse move. So that, that's a very smart person that asked that question because if you push in too hard, the horse will get resentful and they will do that little bit of a tuck and they'll do it quite quick because they want you to stop pushing so hard. So I always start with the pressure that I would push a thumbtack into a cork board. So you're, you know, you have to press in, but you know, you're not trying to actually kill them. You'd like to make a little bit of a dimple in the tissue. You can kind of see my finger marks here. I'd like to make a little bit of a dimple in the tissue to be able to get the uh, exercise done. But I definitely don't want to create any resentment especially if you have an Arab horse or a thoroughbred horse or a running quarter horse that is quite fast twitch. If you press in too hard, the muscle structure around will grab and you won't get the same range of motion. Awesome. Realizing that this is a hindquarter lecture, would it be beneficial to follow pelvic flexions and stretches with belly lifts? Oh, that's a great question. So the nice thing about belly lifts, so just to talk through belly lifts, if anybody on the call doesn't know what a tummy lift is, to do a tummy lift, we're going to look for the lowest part of our horse's back. We're going to follow that all the way around to the ventral surface of the body. We're going to take our fingers and we're just going to scratch underneath there. And we're going to ask for that tummy to lift up. Coco, you're so good, okay? So the, that's a very smart question that that um, person asked because when the back comes up, if you watch this on myself, when the back comes up, you get a little bit of pelvic flexion. When you add pelvic flexion to a tummy lift, you get into true collection. So if you are a Western rider and you're trying for some spins or some slides, if you're an English rider, you're trying for some jumps or any kind of collected work like in dressage, those are two excellent exercises to pair together. Now the one caveat with pairing exercises is what is the rest of the horse doing? And I point at the neck because that is often where the horse is going to go to compensate. So if you add two exercises together, you do a belly lift and you have her tummy come up. Now this horse is very athletic. And then we go ahead with our pelvic tilt and you keep that height of the back. That's a very advanced exercise and an excellent exercise to do. But you'll notice that Coco didn't move her neck at all. She has the strength and the core uh, stability to be able to do this exercise. If your horse doesn't, you're going to notice that they drop their neck down. They use their neck as leverage. They try to stand wide in front. They try to get wide with their hind legs. So really watch for anything like that that's consistent because if that's happening, they're actually trying to use the passive system of the back, which it resides in the neck, to try to hold the back in, um, in uh, the round shape, in, in flexion, to be able to get the pelvic uh, flexion done as well. So we don't want to see that the body has to activate other areas to be able to get the exercise done. 
So super smart question, definitely can be paired together with two exercises and made more difficult. So as we have riders in in, in hand um, that work with in hand, we definitely take um, exercises and pair them together, but we're very cognizant of what the rest of the body's doing. Awesome. And the next one, I have a horse that has weakness on the right side. Should the focus for activation be done equally or a touch more on the right to engage? Super smart question. Okay, so it's we always think to ourselves that we really only want to um, target or activate the weak side. But the interesting thing with the body is, of, of course, because of what we call tensegrity, meaning that the body is all held together, that if we do things extra on one side, we often then are affecting the body in other areas differently only on one side as well. So I always say to people, if I had to do more on the weak side, um, so as the, as the person was mentioning on that right-hand side, I might do five on the left, 10 on the right, five on the left, five more on the right. So I did get more done on the right, but I went back to the left-hand side in between to make sure that I wasn't creating a situation where I just overworked one side. We'll also really mention that if you have a horse with a weakness on one side, always end your workout um, for activations on that weaker side because we want the nervous system to recognize that weaker side more so. So when we're asking that horse to do things, we're going to make sure that that's the side that the nervous system is turned on last, okay? So that's a really important part, super smart question. Great, and for our last question, a uh, question for Coco. Does she carry her tail off to the right to compensate for her left side asymmetry? Yeah, so she's weaker as we saw um, when Cassidy was pointing out. Um, on her static evaluation. She is weaker on that right hind. Um, because she's so athletic, she's really learned how to uh, rotate that pelvis. So the tail is headed over there for balance because when we watched her go, if we remember, you know, she's dumping that pelvis off onto the left-hand side. So that tail is headed to the right to be able to be used for balance. Um, because she came out right out of her stall cold, if we would have done all of her activations like these guys do every time before they get on her, you would notice that that tail goes quite straight. And if you get to see her in the Grand Prix ring with Rachel, you'll also see that that tail goes pretty straight unless she starts to fatigue. And then that's where things start to come out. And that's of course where injuries come is at that point of fatigue. So I do notice sometimes when um, they send me videos of her to be able to evaluate um, that when she's getting more tired closer to the end of the horse show for the week, you do see that the tail goes further to that side. So it is a bit of a tell for sure for our friend Coco. Um, and any of you guys' horses out there that you're noticing that asymmetry, make sure you're really noticing if it changes with fatigue and make sure you notice what happens with your activations because the activations should balance that tail out and it should really change the way they go to move. If it doesn't, please seek some advice from some other team members, your veterinarian, or call in a um, certified insured body worker. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Tina, and the rest of the gang as well. It looks like that's all the questions. Quite a few comments of everyone just really thanking the whole team. Uh, everyone seems to have really enjoyed the session tonight. So much information. Um, but I think uh, people are getting ready for bed here. So thank you so, so much to all of you guys for braving the cold weather. And thanks to uh, Jim and Rachel for letting the AEF come in and have a peek at their place and to use Coco for such a great evening. Excellent. Well, and thank you guys. And thanks to everyone that signed up for the lecture. Um, just as a little bit of a plug, um, we at InHand definitely are always interested to help anybody. So if you're interested in using one of the body workers from InHand, please do check out our website, which I know the girls will link uh, when they send uh, the recording out. I think it's going up on the AAF YouTube channel. 
Um, as well, we do have an online learning platform, which is inhandequinetherapy.podia.com, where we have lots of free and um, other content for people if they want to keep learning. Awesome.